Hey dude, this is Mr. Burger. What's going on? Hey, uh, I'm going to run out to the Speed Art Museum in uh, Kentucky. And I was wondering if you wanted to go. They've got a lot of tapestries and artwork that you might be interested in. I know how much you love that carpet. And uh, it might uh, inspire the old decor. What do you say? Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Welcome to Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger, a professional artist and master educator attempting to provide you with the best in our historical content. Today, we're at the Speed Museum. Let's do a quick tour. So I took a little trip out to the Speed Art Museum in Louisville, Kentucky, and I wanted to compile a grouping of artworks that really caught my attention while walking through there. And so this is my top 11 works from the Speed Art Museum, Louisville, Kentucky, and I'm going to go through these in order from the oldest to the more contemporary. So let's get going with number one here. I'm ready to go in, coach. Just give me a chance. So the oldest piece on my list is this Egyptian mummified ibis with a jar dating back to 332 to 30 BC. So this is uh, one old bird. Now, of course, most of us recognize that Egyptians mummified human beings, but they also would mummify animals. And this would allow them to be a part of the afterlife. Sometimes these were pets or animals for food or other things, but essentially these were offerings to the gods. And these offerings served multiple purposes for their religious practices. Now, this particular jar contained the mummified remains of this bird, which was an offering to the Egyptian god Thoth. They're gonna remind you of what I've been saying. Now, in my mind, one of the more interesting rooms in the museum is this parlor that is primarily created in oak from Broadhamberry, Devon, England. Now, originally, this was made in large panels that could actually be detached, and the figures in the woodwork represent many things. You got myths, you got virtues, vices, zodiac signs, a little bit of everything. And the room was actually sold from the house in the 1920s and sent from England to New York, and eventually kind of migrated around until it arrived in Kentucky, where it was eventually installed in 1944, and since then, it's kind of gone on into a couple of reconfigurations and this is its original configuration as we see it today which is intensely cool in my mind anyway Theodore Chassery is a French romantic painter who is mostly known for portraits historic and religious type paintings and of course doing some murals along the way but this particular work Station of the Cross from 1840, 1856, somewhere in that neighborhood, very much has influenced some of the work and the direction of the work that I'm making right now. I love the in-progress tightness and looseness all at the same time within this work, within this study of a work, as a matter of fact. When we examine Stations of the Cross, each station represents an event at the end of Christ's life. This primary study was used probably for some sort of larger work, but the subject matter of the work was actually a combination of stations 3 and 4, so it depicts Christ falling under the weight of the cross and him encountering his mother Mary who weeps on his shoulder. And again, I love the tightness and looseness in this study. There's no Messiah in here! There's a missile right, but no Messiah! Leonard Wells Volk is an American sculptor who is widely recognized for this particular work, which is a life mask of Abraham Lincoln done in 1860. And the most notable thing about this is the fact that it's one of only two life masks that President Lincoln participated in during his lifetime. So Lincoln and the artist had met through a mutual connection in Chicago, and Lincoln had sat for another sculpture and some other projects, but Volk wanted to make some more detailed busts of Lincoln, and Lincoln, quite frankly, didn't have the time to sit for these. So while Lincoln was in Chicago doing some legal business, 
he agreed to do a life casting of his face so that he wouldn't necessarily have to be there in the studio to be sculpted for several occasions. At any rate, the end result is this particular life mask. You're 10 years older than you were a year ago. Some weariness has bit at my bones. Claude Monet created this fantastic painting of a church at Varganville sur Mer, gray weather from 1882. This tiny little church was painted by Pizarro, Carat, Isabe, and Monet, who actually painted the work multiple times during his career. Now recently, the St. Valerie Church has been threatened by the eroding bank that it sits on, but uh, preservation has gone into effect to try to preserve this tiny little historical church that so many utilized in their works, including Monet, as we see here. And speaking of fantastic impressionists, we can't go without recognizing this work by Mary Cassatt, The Child from 1905. When she was painting this particular work, she was commissioned to paint a couple of other works and murals and things that focused on motherhood to be inside the Pennsylvania State House. Now, one thing would lead to another, and she would end up rejecting the commission, but this study for that project is a very interesting piece, as it is a study for a larger mural-type piece, and that mural was never completed, so it's kind of an interesting cassette work. Black Bear was a member of the Lakota Native American Nation, and as such, art was kind of a part of everyday life, and this particular work is Lone Dog's Winter Count. Now this pictograph illustrates monumental events from the past winter. Now the meanings that are inside of this are memorized by the creator and passed down to the next generation in a sort of oral tradition. Now this count was the first ever to be published in 1877 and how it got in the hands of its European handler we do not know and there is no written explanation of the meaning of the pictographs that are in this work. So much of its history is actually lost, although we can enjoy the work itself. Pride makes a good servant but a poor master. Guy Carlton Wiggins is an American painter who was adopting a lot of the Impressionist techniques here in the United States and applying that to his art that he was making. Now, in this work, the Old Lime Church on Christmas Eve was created about 1925, so it's a little bit after the Impressionists were really in vogue in Paris, but he applied those techniques to this Connecticut church where he had his summer home. And why he was there on Christmas Eve, I don't know. However, Wiggins was very well known for painting his landscapes and things of that nature with the snow falling and that sort of thing. It really creatively inspired him. And this particular church, which was built in 1816, has been the subject of many local artists and artists passing through who were very much inspired by the subject matter. And speaking of churches, Helen LaFrance is a native of Graves County, Kentucky, who was taught to paint by her mother at an early age. And this work of a church picnic was painted based on her observations of such. She learned to paint and draw and make art again from her mother after working on the family farm. And she would be done with the day's work in the corn fields or the tobacco fields and begin to paint as kind of a hobby, but would continue that hobby as a full-time passion in the 1980s. And she very much enjoyed doing so until the time of her passing at the age of 101 in 2020. I mean, anybody could do it, right? Edward Fisk is a modernist painter who created this portrait of Mary Daniel in 1938. He was a New Yorker who trained in Paris and would eventually move to Kentucky in 1926. And there he was teaching at the University of Kentucky while he was known as a kind of lesser known American modernist painter who was very much influenced by the works of Cezanne and Picasso. And he applied those influences to various portraits and things like that, like this one of Mary Daniel, who was his housekeeper and sometimes model. And the final works that I want to look at are this couple of works by Deborah Butterfield. Danta and Burnt Pine are a series of horses that she has done 
and cast in bronze. A lot of times she will use found objects and scrap wood and found branches and things like that for these constructions, but for this one she created a work that was then used to create a casting that was then done in bronze. You can find Deborah Butterfield's work in some of the most prestigious galleries around the world, including the Met, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Brooklyn Museum, and many, many more. I was so inspired by the artworks here, I highly encourage you taking a visit into the Speed Museum if you find your way to Louisville, Kentucky. And I was again so inspired that I've got another set of 11 additional works from the Speed Museum that I'm going to release here soon. When you're visiting galleries, please remember that the work on display is always changing and evolving, so be patient and recognize that you're not always going to see everything at every gallery that you might think should be there. So keep that in mind and enjoy the experience. And until then, I hope you're exploring for new ways and new opportunities to view art in museums and galleries all across our country, as well as our world. Hope you enjoyed that one as much as I appreciate bringing it to you. Make sure you like, follow, share, subscribe, all those fun things. We'll see you next time.